Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, HPU Chapel. Welcome back. Uh, we are glad to see you. Glad you made it back safe and sound. Welcome to the home stretch of the semester. I know it's getting real, and I know that there's a lot to complete before the end of the semester, but if you would indulge me for just a moment, 
um, if you could, with as much faith as possible, I want you to think about how the Lord is about to help you cross the finish line of this semester. And I want you to think about all of the things that you can and will accomplish along the way. So HP Chapel, if you could just take a moment with me to just thank God in advance. You can do better than that. I don't know, that was kind of like a lackluster thank you, you know? Do you want to finish strong this semester? Can you help me thank God in advance? to be back and continue in our worship series tonight called Lead with a Limp. And we're going to focus on something similar to what we've just done, practicing faith over fear, believing in faith over fear, and praying for faith over fear. Can you feel it? Can you hear that? I hope you'll take that in tonight. So we are excited to have university singers and chamber singers here with us. Thank you all for the ministry that you will offer tonight. Uh, we're also excited to have some new Board of Stewards members um, who are joining us tonight. You'll hear a little bit more from them um, in just a moment, but thank you all so much. We're excited to have you on the board. So as we continue into worship, I wanna invite you to, just as you are, go ahead and relax yourselves into your chairs and start taking some easy breaths. Maybe as we're getting started, we can ground ourselves back to practicing faith over fear with each breath. And when you're ready, we'll take our first deep breath right here together, breathing in and breathing out. Again, breathing in and breathing out. One more time, breathing in, and breathing out. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, for the moments that we wait, the ones that we learn to rest in you, the moments that we might struggle on, for the everyday miracles and ways you continue to invite us into joy, we say thank you. And now as we worship, may we experience a deep grounding in you, a refreshing and a deeper rest in your presence as you continue to equip us for the journey ahead. These things we ask in your name, amen. Jehovah, and uh, the bridge has um, some words in Hebrew, so I'm going to translate those for you so that you know what we're singing about and um, know how to glorify best in that moment. So uh, the first one we're going to sing is Jehovah Nisi. This means uh, the Lord of victory, um, followed by Jehovah Jireh, which is the Lord shall be seen, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, and Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Please stand and sing with us. Call the name, call the name, 
you to pass the peace of Christ with one another. May peace be with you. My name is Jessica Elwood. I'm a member of the Board of Stewards, and I'm excited to welcome you all to worship tonight. Here are a few updates from the board. 
We are currently partnering with the Salvation Army in their annual Angel Tree Project. Our goal this year is to raise $10,000 to go and buy Christmas presents for children in the community. We are very excited to announce that we are only 1,500 away from reaching that goal. If you would like to help us in our efforts, you can donate through cash, check, or through the website on the flyer. In the past, groups have helped us by sponsoring a child. If your organization is interested, just let us know. Also, we will be having a Pi Board of Stewards member fundraiser tentatively next Friday the 27th to raise money for the Angel Tree Project. This fundraiser will take place on the Slam basketball courts from 12 o'clock to 1.30 p.m. If you have any questions, please come find a Board of Stewards member. And again, thank you for being here and welcome. Hey guys, I'm Cindy Litwiller. I'm a member of the Board of Stewards. And I'm Meredith Day, and I'm also a member of the Board of Stewards. And we're your recruitment chairs, so can we invite all of the new Board of Stewards members up to the stage real quick? Thanks, guys. <laughs> all right, and if you could each just introduce yourself, say your grade, and then something you're excited, you know, about the Board of Stewards about. Thank you guys so much. We're so excited to have you.
Hi, everyone. My name is Kaylee, and um, would you please join me in praying this evening? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, just this amazing week you've given us um, so far, Lord, and just for all the many blessings uh, this week has provided for us, Lord. I pray uh, that this service is um, just a reflection of you and your people, Lord, um, just as we come together to serve you and worship you um, as a community. I also pray over Preston and his message, and um, just that his uh, words um, are just straight from you, Lord, and um, not from anything else. Uh, now join me um, and pray as the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Liebkamen, and I'm going to be reading the scripture for tonight. Uh, our scripture comes from Psalm 3. Uh, verses 1 through 8. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. I am not afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Rise up, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek, you break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Do y'all need some time to adjust the microphone or are we ready to rock? Great rock. Um, have one more round of applause for university singers, please. That was lovely. I'm so glad to be back with y'all this week. It's, it's never the same. Um, my weeks are never the same if I don't have this moment and have this moment with y'all. Uh, in the church I used to serve before here, uh, we'd have these times called um, Joys and Concerns. Anybody have these? Anybody grow up in a little tiny church? Anybody have joys and concerns when they when they uh, grow up? Well, you're about to experience them. This is how this is how it works. So, uh, major joy uh, in our community. Uh, where's our chaplain for graduate students? Jim Smith welcomed his fourth grandchild into the world uh, this week. Caroline, first granddaughter. Let's have a big round of applause for Jim. Jim, we are grateful for you here, and we hope Caroline doesn't take you away from us very much. So. Uh, and that's the joy part. The concern part is what many of us have on our hearts and minds over the last week and a half. Uh, watching our news feeds, watching the news, watching home invasions, watching children bombed, and all of that. And I want to take a moment of silence, and then with the ill-equipped words that I have, we will pray. And pray that God can intercede in ways that we don't have imaginations for, but we pray that God does. So let's take a moment of silence and then we'll pray. Gracious God, uh, the one who is Jehovah Jireh, the one who will be seen, uh, we're praying you will be seen. Jehovah Rapha, the one who heals, uh, we pray that you do some healing for a lot of people. For we've watched home invasions, watched families torn from one another. We have pray prayers for those who are in Israel. And we have prayers for Palestinians who are told to flee but have nowhere to go. And we remember that at our best, everyone who breathes is a child of God. 
And so where the violence goes deep, we pray that your mercy goes deeper still. Where we are short on words and the violence is long, we pray that your spirit intercedes where we have sighs too deep for words. And we pray that your spirit gets inside the, heart, gets inside the hearts and minds of people who can actually change things. Do what only you can do. And may we be witnesses to something like that. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. One of the best things that I did hear this week was from a world leader who said, uh, now is the time, not for examples of power, but to be a powerful example. Not to be an example of power, but to be a powerful example. Uh, That's a pretty good segue for where we are in the series. I'm trying to, we're trying to spend some time thinking about what does leadership look like when it comes under the yoke of Christ? What does leadership look like when it comes under the reign of Christ? When you put a Christian in front, the word Christian in front of leadership, does it change? And I'd say it looks something like that. You don't become an example of power. You try to become a powerful example, which means you lead from anywhere, not just from the front. Uh, and this week, I want to talk uh, more deeply about something that's really important to me and think about that, what leadership really is. And it's, uh, it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. And it's what you do with fear that comes up inside you all the time, and you've got to do something with it, otherwise it will do something to you. Uh, my wife and I love the show. Maybe, I don't know if uh, young folks, y'all get into it. We're Ted Lasso fans. Any Ted Lasso fans in here? Uh, please bear with this uh, old millennial uh, as I tell you about Ted Lasso a little bit. So we've watched it like two or three times. And it's fall break. Y'all are gone. I got a little more time. I started watching Ted Lasso again because it's like, it's like comfort food. And like, I'm, I'm watching uh, Ted Lasso, and I'm watching the second season. And Ted Lasso, it's, the, the premise is utterly preposterous. Uh, he is a American football coach who goes to coach an uh, English football team, soccer, and like has no clue what he's doing. It's absurd, Samantha. Like, no reason he should be there, right? And uh, he, in the second season, he started seeing this therapist like undergoes like the trauma he has had in his life. I won't spoil it for you, but it's just like someone close to him has died by suicide, and he has not figured this out, and like how to get past this and his own abandonment issues. And uh, it, the show does so well in dealing with mental illness and dealing with how to lead in a servant leadership way of how teams come together so well. It's beautiful. And he's meeting with his therapist, and his therapist says to him of this soccer coach, who's a football coach, who always wears this stupid visor and these big sunglasses. Thank you for those of you who have seen the show. We're like, your eyes are so bright, and it's making me very happy right now. <laughs> she says to him, heavy is the head that wears the visor, Coach Lasso. Heavy is the head that wears the visor, which is a takeoff of heavy is the head that wears the crown, which is really to say, like, anyone who leads and wants to lead well, almost all leadership is what you do with fear, what you do with the weight, because if you don't do something, it will do something to you. Uh, The Psalms are one of my favorite things to get in to think about this. Uh, and this Psalm 3, I think, exemplifies it in such beautiful ways. And you've got to hear it with the right ears, otherwise this ancient language just sounds like more violence, doesn't it? It's not that at all. Now, the Psalms are a beautiful way of actually dealing with the emotions, actually dealing with our emotional lives. We've got a lot of it. Uh, it. Tim Keller says this a lot better, man. Much of the way I'm framing this message tonight comes from him. Check it out on YouTube. Uh, you can see it. But, like, what this psalm does, and most psalms, is there's like two really ways that you can deal with your emotions. One, if you grew up kind of in a house like I did, you just push them down. You just kind of push them all the way to the basement. This is the kind of I'm fine, you're fine, no one's really fine kind of house. You know what I'm talking about? I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, no one's really fine. Or like you may have grown up in a different place where you just, you want to be authentic or something, or you want to be genuine, so you always express your emotions, you always say like it is, you say what's on your heart. And if they think about that, at the end of that, the only person who really does that, like who tells their emotions all the time, are like little children. And so you think like, oh, maybe that's not what it is to be authentic. Maybe that's actually immaturity. Well, the Psalms don't do that. The Psalms actually take it a third way. 
And it's actually taken the depths of your heart and the cries of your heart and all the emotions that's within you, joy, sadness, and everything, and, and you lift them up before God. And you say, hold these things, because I can't hold them all, Caleb. I need you to hold them with me, for me. That's what the Psalms are. It's David not just like spewing emotion or spewing his fear, which is what he's got. It's, it's like he's lifting it up and saying, I, I can't hold all that's within me, God. Will you hold some of it? Well, it's a third way. It's not just pushing down one's emotions, and it's not just expressing them endlessly. It's, God, hold these, because I can't hold them all. Uh, some might even say, like, the fear that's in David in this psalm, uh, and he's a leader, and the fear that's in him, uh, fear itself for all of us, that might be the most, like, primary emotion among all emotions. Why? Think about if you were to ever see a newborn come into the world. It is just screaming. There is no silent nights, trust me. Like, it is just screaming joy. That's all it is. And it's like, why? It's not because of grief. It's not because of uh, sadness. It's because they're terrified. Uh, Martha Nussbaum is a great philosopher. She wrote a book on fear a few years ago, and she said, toddlers must either be tyrants or die. <laughs> Nothing more true has ever been written, ever. And some of you are, like, in your early 20s now, like, I've been here long enough to know that, like, some of you will have children within a decade, and you will get to experience this, and it gives me great joy. It gives me great joy. Toddlers must either uh, be tyrants or die. Why? Because they're terrified, and they know if they get their terror out, somebody will prayerfully, hopefully, will respond, take care of them. Fear, it's like a primary thing that's within us, and if you don't do something with it, it will do something to you. Uh, so David, he lifts up the, the, the fear that's within him. And it, and it, he doesn't want to be an infant. He doesn't want to push it down. He doesn't want to just vent it on social media like most of us. He wants to model taking it before God to let God deal with it so it doesn't deal with him. So there's two parts in the psalm that we're going to dig into tonight. It's kind of that diagnosis and prescription if we follow it well enough. And it's first part and a second part. I want us to go line by line and look at how beautiful this is if we were actually to take the depths of our fear and let God enter into it and, some, and, take, and be a part of it. Now, maybe like you grew up in a church, maybe you could push, maybe you uh, want to be like, yeah, it's time for me to leave because you've only heard like pray away your fear. Uh, prayer is actually very helpful for this, but like, like therapy is good too. Like if you have chemical imbalance, medication is good too. Like the depths of your fear are those things. But I would say like it's like therapy and prayer. It's like exercise and prayer. It's like um, eat well and prayer. Like not either or, but both and for a healthy whole life. Are you with me? Like do them both. Like, like don't hear that if that's what you hear from me tonight. No, but let's go into the psalm. It's absolutely lovely what, uh, what David does in the psalm uh, to show us maybe a better way of understanding our fear and not to find a way out of our fear, but through it. Because I don't know if you get to a place where it's actually you're beyond it. It's just putting it in its proper place. Uh, Elizabeth Gilbert's got a great uh, way of talking about fear. She imagines uh, she's on a cross-country trip, and she imagines actually fear's got a healthy role to play. Like, and like she imagines fears in her car on this cross-country trip, and uh, she says of her fear, fear, uh, she has a dialogue with fear, fear, I know you're here to protect me. You're good for me, actually. Uh, but fear, you don't get to drive. You have to stay in the back seat. And that's some of it, fear in its proper place. Let's read the beginning of the psalm right here. Oh, that's a nice graphic. That was fun. <laughs> oh, Lord, how many are my foes. Many are rising against me. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. David's actually pointing out two things here. He's pointing out, like, some good fear and some bad fear. And it begins with, a, can we come back to it? Can we, can we put it up, please? I want to keep it up there. Lord, how many are my foes? He sounds kind of paranoid at the beginning, doesn't he? Like, well, he actually does have an army after him. It's like his, his son and him have had the worst kind of falling out, and his son is coming to take over him and, uh, and his kingdom and take it away. And so that first fear is actually, there's something good about it. It's actually the fear that's within all of us that says, like, protect yourself. Take care of yourself. But then there's the second one. Many are rising against me. No, 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 come back, come back. Many are saying to me, there is no help for you in God. And this is like a fear that goes deeper than just 
fear that wants to protect. This is fear that comes more in the place of like a deep anxiety. It's going to the core of who he is. His identity itself. He's saying there's no reprieve. There's no place beyond this. You're done for and you can't even get help from God. And I was just pointing out there's this like kind of there's a healthy fear and there's an unhealthy fear here. A lot of really good writers in the mid 20th century have written about fear really well. Uh, like Rollo May, uh, my wife's one of his favorite. Um, she's one of, uh, he's one of her favorite authors. And, uh, and he writes about like the, the, there's the healthy fear that's, that's there to protect you, but then the unhealthy fear is that which is more diffuse and uncertain and the experiences of health, you have experiences of, of helplessness toward it. And I think about y'all often with that kind of definition, like your early 20s, all it is is uncertainty in front of you. Like there's no, almost no way out that there's going to be some kind of anxiety for your life. It's uncertainty that swirls around you all the time, right? Uh, there, was this, there was this book written in the early 20th century by W.H. Auden called The Age of Anxiety. And that was 100 years ago, which then how much more now? It's anxiety all the time, where there's something that attacks the core of our identity, and we don't know who we are. I love uh, how, how uh, Herbert McCabe, one of my favorite theologians, says about like, anxiety, and, and this is viewing it through like, a spiritual theological lens, the anxiety that, that all of us, so many of us have. And he, and he wrote this. He said, uh, the root of all sin is fear. We can throw this up. The root of all sin is fear. That may sound odd to you, but trust me, this is true if you ever think about when you're anxious, were you actually your best self? Or did you do the things that you like, wish you hadn't the most? Yeah, there's something when we're in our deep depths of our insecurity, we play out identities that are not who we are. He says, the root of all sin is fear. A fear one does not matter, does not really exist. The fear that if one really looked into the center of oneself, there would be nothing there. The fear not just that one is playing a false part, wearing a disguise, but the one is nothing but a disguise. Yo, this was written like 40 years ago, but you know what this is? It's what so many of us go through. It's imposter syndrome. Or even deeper than imposter syndrome. Like that I actually don't have an identity at all. And that creates this kind of deep anxiety, this kind of hole within us that we've got to fill, we've got to do something. You can do something so desperate from that position. You do something so disastrous from that position. And bring it back to like a leadership position, why this is so important. Because think about what you do to other people if you're trying to get out of that desperation. Think about like what you do to other people who you think are beneath you if you don't do something with that kind of desperation. You've got to do something about it, this kind of anxiety that wells up within us because uh, it can be used in such desperate or destructive ways. I mean, I think about uh, the conflict in Israel and Palestine right now. In some ways, you could say that both places, both people, are so fearful that they won't have an identity that it comes out in force. They're so fearful that they'll be wiped off the face of the earth that they won't have an identity, that the only option is to take that deep anxiety and turn it into rage. And it's a thing that needs to be healed you got to do something with that anxiety or it'll do something to you. Do you see? And it can be in far geopolitical ways and it can happen right in the middle of our own lives too. You've got to do something with it or it'll do something to you. This fear that even comes into anxiety, unhealthy fear. Uh, here's, what, uh, here's, here's the thing for this though. There's like a healthy fear, the unhealthy fear. There's like a, a healthy fear that propels you forward. The unhealthy fear, like it... The, the, the root of the word anxiety itself is ange, and it means choke. That's how it feels like. It feels like it's choking you. And so here's what David's got for us today. If this is kind of the description, if this is the diagnosis, he's got three moves for us to help not get out of it, but to get through it. And here they are. It's to keep moving, for, keep moving forward into trust in God. It's to redirect your glory to something bigger than you. And finally, it's to turn your vision to others. These are the three things I want to dive into. Keep moving forward while trusting in God, even in the midst of fear. Redirect glory to something much bigger than you. 
and turn vision, your vision to others. So if, if, if David started this prayer, this, this fear that's within him, and he's lifted up to God and said, do something with it, it, it doesn't stay there. It moves on. And it writes, he, writes, he says this. This is his prayer. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts up my head. Y'all, this is actually so lovely. You are the shield, not in front of me. You are the shield, not beside me. You are the shield, what? Around me. You already go into like ancient, like military practices to understand what he's trying to say here. Like, if there was, like, a small shield, like, this is what the commentary say, if it was, like, a small shield, it would be, like, a small shield that you would, like, be able to block with and, like, attack with, block with, attack with. But this is a shield that's all around me. Like, the only shield that would be like that would be something that looks like this. It would be, like, a, a shield that, like, takes you into going a siege into, like, a fortress. You see the, on the end of it? And so the subversiveness of David here, this isn't saying go do this. This is the prayer. This is the language he has. It's the honesty of his heart. What he's saying is the metaphor. He's being subversive. He's taking military language and turning it upside down to something that could be healed. And here's what he's saying. And this is why this is so important. He's saying, like, God, you're my shield that's all around me. And what he's saying first there is what many of us really need to do, which is to realize the things that is most courageous that we can do are not in the absence of fear. It's right in the presence of fear. Why? Because this kind of shield is actually what takes you in to battle. And again, I'll say it again. He's not talking about actually doing battle. He's talking about doing battle with his own fear and letting God help him with that. And he's saying that this kind of shield is what actually might take you in to places of conflict in the world, take you in to places that are uncomfortable, take you into places where you actually might feel more fear. So if it was odd to have a Ted Lasso reference uh, in a sermon, uh, the other thing I used to watch years ago, uh, and it was way too gory for me, so I had to stop watching it, but was Game of Thrones. Um, maybe the first time ever a pastor with a collar on has referenced Game of Thrones in a sermon. And, uh, but there's this scene uh, in Game of Thrones in the first season where Ned Stark is talking to his son, uh, Brand Brandon. Brandon. I forget. Um, and um, and his son is just, he's fairly in awe of his father's courage. And his father, he has to see do some, uh, some really difficult things. And he, and, he, and, he's, and he asks of his father, he says, Dad, uh, is it possible for a frightened person to be courageous? And his father, Ned, who's this incredibly righteous person, just depth of character says, that's the only kind of person who can be courageous. And it's a reminder for us that the most courageous things we do in life are not in the absence of fear. They're in the exact places of fear. The temptation would be to be an example of power rather than a powerful example. To flee toward destructive purposes, but actually the courage would be to be look more like Christ-like. And take this a little further. Like if you think about, like if, if, if what this metaphor is talking about, like you are my shield, if you think about the Christian faith, if you're going to follow Jesus, it's like, bless those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Jesus rarely removes us from places of fear. He takes us into them to be people of peace and courage. Absolutely beautiful and so necessary for the world. Do you see? It's amazing. And it won't be in the absence of fear. It'll be right in the places of fear that courage is most needed when it's most compassionate. I mean, you could step back and run the other direction, but that's, you know, that's doom. It's always forward. It's always moving forward. And it's always seeing the God who goes ahead of you and saying, I, I, I'm pursuing you in the places where you would go to heal. May I be part of that? Keep moving forward. Keep the trust even in the places of fear in your life. Like, you may not even be able to see past the horizon, but the horizon is just the limit of your sight. Like, you still go forward. Keep moving forward, trust in God, even if you can't see the whole picture. And that shield that's around you that takes you into these places. 
Um, it, he takes it a little further, though. Like if it's if it's keep moving forward, even if you can't see. If it's it's having courage, even in the places of fear. He says this. Come back to the psalm. Or the next slide. But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts up my head. I love this part. You really see how he says but on the beginning of it? And there's this word glory. He says, God, you are my glory. What's the temptation of, like, uh, bad leadership? Isn't it always kind of like, look at me? Look at what I've done? Um, I don't know who said it, but, like, if you want to see an organization that, like, or a team that does something well, it's, it's where no one takes credit. Like, no one needs to take credit. No one needs to have glory. Like, you show me that kind of team, and that team's going through the playoffs. I don't care who they are. It's like a team that knows how to fight for each other and not have to get credit or glory. That's beautiful. David, and this is the same temptation for any of us. Like, his, his temptation is that for it to be about his glory. Like, think about him. Like, this is the little kid who took down Goliath. Like, he raised Goliath's head above himself. He's popular as all get out. Or he's like the one who's been king. He's like, he could put his glory in the power that he has. But all that's gone. He's wasted all of it. He's ruined all of it. He's let it all go to his head. And here there's this turn where it's not about his glory. He's saying, God, it's for your glory. Like, you're my shield. You're my glory. You're the one who I devote my life to. He's shifting the focus from himself to God. And the beautiful part here. Uh, is that, like, he says this next part where he says, and God, you lift, you're the lifter of my head. Don't miss this. This is lovely. I think any of us who want to lead well in all of our lives, the temptation is to say, no, I can lift my head myself, thank you. And you turn those around you actually into enemies if you don't receive help. But here he's actually receiving help. He's saying, you're the lifter of my head. Uh, it was years ago, uh, this video went viral of the UCLA basketball team that I absolutely love. They're in, a, they're in a game, and it's toward the end of the game, and they're down by two points. Uh, and there's this player on the team who's their center, Moses Brown. He's in the NBA now. And he throws a wild, errant pass, and it goes out of bounds, and his head just drops to his chest. Drops to his chest. And within two seconds, his teammate Jalen Hands, who's the point guard, comes by, and takes his chin from here to here. Absolutely stunning. And I think about that, and I think about, like, that's what God, I think, is trying to do all the time for you and me. Like, take your, hand, your, your chin from here to here, if we just let God do it. But some of us are so busy saying, I need to lift my own chin, because we're so addicted to thinking, like, it needs to be about my glory my independence, my prize, my story, that we miss that actually there's a, a beautiful move throughout this world of God's spirit, this hum that's inside each and every one of you that's seeking to lift your head again and again and again, even in the midst of fear. Not about your glory, but the one who's in you. Not about you, but the one who dwells in you and with all of us and amongst us. If we would pay a little more attention. He redirects his glory. He goes from, he goes from uh, seeing that God is a shield that takes him into places even that he wouldn't want to be in and is with him. A God who doesn't protect him but is with him. A God who is minimum protection but maximum support is also the same God who says it's not about you. It's about a depth of love that goes beyond you. And the thing this goes even further, this is so lovely. This is, uh, it goes further. Uh, David, he, he not only says, like, but you are my glory. He says, you're the one who lifts up my head. And what he's remembering here, go to the next slide, it goes to the next psalm, he says, and I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy hill. Stay with me. He, answer, he answers me from his holy hill, and I finally lie down and sleep. I wake again, for the Lord sustains me. He actually has some peace as he moves through this psalm, as he voices his fear that's within inside him to God and lets, and lets God hold it. And he says he looks to this holy hill. What's he talking about? 
He's talking about Mount Moriah. He's talking about where the tabernacle is. He's talking about where God has kept covenant and wants to hold the fear and shame and sin of the world. And what he's actually doing is he's remembering a promise that God has made to people who've gone way before him, the people who've gone way before you in this promise of God. The same language that he remembers in this psalm of God, you are my shield, is the same language that God gives to someone before him named Abraham. And it comes from Genesis 15. And it's a weird scene from our vision, but it's a weird scene where God says to Abraham that I will be with you always. I'll make your ancestors like the stars of the, of the, of the, of the universe if you could count them all. And Abraham's still scared. He's fearful. He says, how will I know? And this is the weird part. Uh, God says, well, like, take all these animals and, like, cut them up and spread them around. <laughs> and we're like, that's the strangest thing in the world. Uh, but, like, in ancient world, ancient society, like, this is what a covenant would look like. This is what a contract would look like. This is what a vow would look like. And the intention would be like this. It would be like, uh, if I were to break this vow, if I were to break this promise, may the same happen to me that has happened to these animals. Hmm. Like, there's actually some weird wisdom there. It's like it's taken its promise really seriously. Like, I think about us that maybe, like, some of the reasons we're so anxious is, like, we don't know how to keep promises well for the future. Like, a promise at its best, if it's that kind of depth and devotion, it's making safe harbor into a future that's super uncertain for all of us. But if you took that promise that seriously, whew, it would give people some comfort and trust. Like, I'm thinking about the weddings that I do of actually doing some of this. Do you think that would work out? Yeah? No? No more? No animals? Okay, cool. All right. But like, there, you think that couples, like, would, would take it more seriously? It would be great. There's something about that that actually takes promises more seriously that actually reduce some anxiety in us if we saw the future with that kind of hope. Make it way less uncertain. Maybe way less insecure. Here's what happens that's so profound, though. Abraham, in this part in Genesis, knows that what God's saying is like it's him entering into a covenant, and he's going to have to make some promises. But what's next is profound. Instead of him making the promises, is that he sees God's spirit move between the animals. And it's as if God is saying, I know you can't keep promises, but I can. And like, I know that you won't be able to live unashamed, but I will, I will be there for you. It's as if like centuries later, what we're seeing there is exactly what Jesus does in his own body on the holy hill. Like to say like, you can't live an unafraid life, but give me your shame. Give me your sin. I'm a kind of God who will get cut up for you and be there for you endlessly and do what you can't do. Hmm. Like, let me hold not just your sin, but your shame and your fear. It keeps you strangled. Absolutely beautiful. And like, you put your trust in that, and it actually takes you on a further journey with your fear that gets put in its proper place and doesn't get to speak into the identity of who you are and make you do destructive and, di and disastrous things to other people to have a kind of identity where you thought nothing was there because you put your trust in that. You put your trust in him and in that kind of love that goes before you and is the shield around you. You see that that's the one who gets the glory and not you. The way that it's put in the New Testament, and you've probably heard it before, and um, this is, the, this is the, where the last part of it, um, let me say the psalm and then we'll, why this is so important for where it goes. The psalm ends this way. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. May your blessings be on your people. It's as if the whole psalm, David's learned how to lead again. He's gone from a place where he's preoccupied with his own fear and his own anxiety, and it's back to actually those he wants to serve. He wants to be a blessing. Uh, the way it's put in the New Testament is this way. Is that a uh, great passage uh, from 1 John 4.18 is that perfect love casts out fear. And there may be some of us that, like, that feels like that's pretty shaming, right? Like, I still got a lot of fear, so I'm not, only, but I'm not done with this. But that's actually a pretty good thing. It means Jesus isn't done with you yet. He's taking you on a further journey where you can still cast out some fear. But what it's pointing out is that the opposite of love is not hate. It's fear. And if fear is not dealt with, it will turn into something quite destructive. 
And it really shows that so much of our fear is tied to our self-centeredness. And we'll never know the, fe- know the end of fear and anxiety if we don't actually turn outward. One of my favorite pastoral uh, sessions was with a student two years ago who was in therapy, and she said uh, her therapist had actually told her to go serve at a local soup kitchen. <laughs> and I went like, that's beautiful. And she's like, it's the worst. <laughs> and I said, why is it the worst? And she said, because I'm doing the very thing that I'm most scared of doing. Turning outward to others to be of service. Can I tell you how much healing that ex student had over the course of that year? Because it looked something more than it looked something so beautiful beyond what they thought they could do and ended up doing. And actually did some own healing for their own soul. Uh, one of the best advice I ever got was when I first started here. And uh, it was going and having lunch with this wacky, wonderful prof- professor in the religion department, Thaddeus. If you haven't had a class with Thaddeus, you're living half a life. And Thaddeus is wonderful. He takes me over to Barberitos on a Friday. We're having fish tacos. Great. Like, I remember this. This is a decade ago. And I'm telling him about that. I'm about to go do a sermon at a local church that's invited me. And I'm, I'm, I'm missing, like, the last thing I'm going to say. And he's like, well, this sounds like, like, it sounds like you're trying to say this. And I'm like, well, tell me about it. And he goes, ah, it's from a silly movie. You're like, there's no reason you would have seen it or, like, you, you need to use it. And they wouldn't know it anyways. And I'm like, like, here's what happens if you hang out with me. Like, any of our conversations, they're fair game. Like, it might show up in a sermon. And uh, I'm like, no, no, tell, tell me about it. He's like, ah, it's from this stupid movie in the movie in the 90s. It's called Three Kings. And I'm like, yeah, I think I know that one. And it's got George Clooney and Ice Cube, Spike Jones. He's like, that's the one. That's the one. And he goes, well, there's this scene. And I go, oh, I forget the scene. He goes, well, there's this scene where they decided this movie's about Three Kings. It's, 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 it's a Middle East war, the first Gulf War. And they've decided that instead of, like, they found all of Saddam Hussein's gold. And Saddam, and, they, and like, they, they call it bullion. They found all his gold, and they're going to become kings. Richer than they could ever imagine. But they see the Kuwaiti people, who are under missile threats again and again, who are under being bombed, who are being pushed out. And, and, and they decide there's, they, they can't just do nothing. They've got to do something for these people. And so they go over this plan of how they're going to help. And, and uh, George Clooney, you know George Clooney, like he takes charge. Yeah, he's all over it. And Spike Jones says, wait, 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 I want to go, I want to go over this plan one more time. And Clooney says, as only Clooney can, he says, you're scared, aren't you? And Jones says, maybe, so what? And Clooney says, first you do the thing that you're terrified of, and then you get the courage to do it. And Joan says, well, that's stupid. It should be the other way around. And Clooney says, yeah, but that's the way it works. We will never be done with the fear and anxiety of our life until we move into an outward gaze of service to others in a way that actually just looks just like Jesus. Like the one who is our shield, who takes us into places we'd rather not go. The one who gets all the glory instead of our own selves and worrying who gets the credit. Like, and the one who again and again helps put our fear in its proper place so it doesn't have the driver's seat. It gets a back seat and he gets the wheel. Let's pray. Gracious God, take us on that kind of further journey with you where fear doesn't have the last word in our lives that we become a kind of people who aren't an example of power, but become a powerful example of your love, no matter where we are and in what you've put our hands to doing. May we do it with full heart and love and be of service to your world. And all God's people said. stand and sing with us. Need you.
just want to thank you, Lord. right afterwards go deeper into the scriptures some other folks be good for you um, I know that Hillel has a vigil over at Cottrell Amphitheater for Israel for those who feel called to do that uh, next Monday there is also going to be a gathering of our Interfaith United group um, they're, fra they're framing the conversation for the Israel-Palestinian conflict seeking to understand more than to be understood uh, if you have questions about that see Cameron Collis can you raise your hand Cameron Cameron's over there on the end raise it high Cameron please um, thank you Cameron um, <laughs> Uh, Cameron's one of the presidents of uh, Interfaith United and should be happy to answer questions. But may you go from this place, putting fear in its proper place. May you do something with it and that it shall not do something to you. May you lift it up to the one who takes you on a further journey and shows you what it is to love this world well and your own self well. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.